Hello everyone and welcome. Um, can you hear me all right? Uh, we tried to make this as, as much, to give this as much contrast uh, as possible, but uh, still. Um, can everybody see this? All right, so um, I think let's start. So who are, who are we? I, I'm Tasos Kutlas, I'm senior technical consultant uh, with Cameron Wilding in London. Uh, my name is Alessa Stranger. Um, I work for Investors and People. Um, it's kind of the client within within this um, kind of presentation. So I'm uh, currently a product owner within that within that um, organisation. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, Great. <laughs> um, yeah. So Alessa Stranger, one of the product owners within Investors and People. So in the third entity uh, within this work uh, was Big Blue Door, which was uh, doing the the, the the technical delivery of of the project. So, a few words about the investors and people. Yeah, so essentially this talk is going to talk about how those three partners have come together um, on a key project to look at our digital pla platforms of, at investors and people. Um, so a bit of a background to investors and people in the organisation. Um, so we are the UK's leading people management standard. Um, we offer accreditation for employers, so we're looking at um, recognising and celebrating high performance cultures within organisations. Um, originally set up within government within 1990 and we're kind of commercially driven now and financially self-sustaining. Um, we've got a large client base of kind of around 14,000 accredited organisations um, across the UK mainly and some internationally. Um, to give a bit of a context as to why this project came about, so we launched a new standard, so that's kind of the framework and the content at the heart of investors and people um, in September of 2015. Um, alongside that, we're looking at our digital platforms and how we deliver that accreditation via that and also via offline methods. So this project really looked at um, delivery and iteration of those platforms in order to support that new product. Um, we managed the product and the brand at a head office team, a very small team. Um, that's why kind of we rely on external resources and we'll, we'll talk more about that obviously as purpose of this presentation, so why we kind of worked with um, Tassos at Cameron Wilding and why we kind of outsource our external development team. Um, and we also have a kind of a, a larger infrastructure of delivery teams and delivery networks. So, um. so us, uh, as Cameron Wilding, we, we are lo uh, we're located in London, in Elephant and Castle, for uh, you know. Um, we, we do primarily four things. Uh, we, do, um, we help organizations uh, transition into a, an agile way of thinking and delivery uh, of their products. We help with strategy, UX, and design. And we are a technology partner as well. So we are specialized in Drupal and other open source solutions. So we, do, we do that for them. You can follow that link and see some of the work we do and the clients we work with. So just to give you a bit more um, context into the situation kind of pre this project and pre kind of our, our change in ways of working. Um, so we are, as I say, at Investors and People, a very small team. Um, we work, therefore, with um, our development partner, which is Big Blue Door. And we wanted some resource as kind of technical lead, but also to kind of help us transition into an agile way of working and consistently apply that across Investors and People. Um, so we have kind of a core user base of our platforms. So those are individual consultants delivering investors and people to organizations, using our platforms on a day-to-day -day basis to help them do that. Um, and we were looking at iterative development to support those people. Um, we obviously have a very large client base and we also have platforms that those can also engage with. So we're talking quite, quite a large client base. Um, we had complex six systems and multiple digital products, and we're looking to consistently apply some methodologies to that and do some kind of fast and ambitious work with those. We have limited in-house technical expertise, um, hence why we work with kind of de external development partners. So we're looking to bring about a culture whereby we could start to share that knowledge and expertise. Um, we had a very traditional approach to project management. Um, we were kind of heavily specking up front and kind of allowing that to then go on technical side and not being too involved in that. So we really, at the heart of investors and people, brought about kind of a product team, um, a very small team, and looked at how we could start to translate requirements and work with the technical guys to actually deliver core functionality and be involved together as that part of that process. 
We had a very patchy approach to testing. What we found is we were releasing functionality that was very buggy, um, and it was causing us a lot of issues. Um, releases weren't very scheduled, um, and we were looking to cons consolidate that. Um, so Tassos will talk you through kind of th the key challenge. Yeah, so we identified challenges in, in three main areas. First was um, to identify the nature of uh, the bugs and stabilize the digital platform. Uh, and that was due to the fact that um, we had every trust in everyone, uh, everyone involved in the project, but yet we still uh, were having bugs. So there was something there to be done. And we needed to identify why that was happening and how we could actually mitigate some of those factors. Um, the second was that um, uh, we wanted to create something that uh, it could then scale up to, to other products and be the base, the steady base for, for delivering new innovation going forwards. And the third one was to, to transition. Um, there, there was a, there was a, a strategic um, um, decision from, uh, from investors in Google that they, they would like to work more as a, as a lean and agile organization so they could get more innovation forwards. So um, they, the, the real issue was that we had to achieve that within six months because that was the budget allocated and that was the, the period we had to actually show that the way that we we are suggesting to work with that would be, um, it, it, it can be done in, in, in a way. So um, when I was called into the project and I, I met uh, the team, I had to assess the situation a little bit. So um, as we usually do with all of our uh, clients, we suggested a, a sprint zero. So that sprint zero was a discovery um, uh, mechanism for me to understand all the, the, the different um, the different issues and um, um, and whatnot I within the organization. So um, we identified um, issues in, in three main categories. So um, there were communication issues within the team and within the, the general organization. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into these into more details um, in the subsequent uh, slides. But essentially, the three three main areas was communication, the project delivery and the, the quality um, of, of, of what we are, we are getting. So um, first communication. So um, sometimes we say, especially in Agile, that uh, it's the, the interactions between the people are more uh, important than the, um, than the tools and the processes we have, uh, which is true. But these need to happen within a structured way. So what we understood uh, when we got into that project is that there were too many different tools were, to use, uh, were used to track those conversations that they were happening. And the discussions were happening across different mediums and channels. So emails were, um, were, were used uh, at some point and then conversations were switching into phone calls between specific individuals and then a Slack channel was there and uh, some other individuals were having discussion around that. And then um, there were also uh, different trackers tracking progress of specific things and then they had comments. Uh, and that was doing, uh, was, was not doing the project any justice at all because essentially uh, the whole message was diluted between those channels and the mediums and no one actually knew what was the current version of any conversation. So some people might have a different version of events or not uh, as updated as somebody else within, because they weren't part of that uh, conversation. Uh, and on top of that, we had too many people involved at different levels. Uh, and that was causing problems because uh, then the message needed to be contained. Um, it, it was not contained in a way, and it was uh, across different people. Um, Another thing that we've seen about communications was that there was uh, panic when bags were introduced and there wasn't um, any, any real process to actually deal uh, with those issues. So uh, depending on the nature of the bag and who was answering uh, the phone or was uh, capturing that information within the, the bag tracking system, then they had that then to take it up to themselves, to put it across to the development partner and then come back to a solution. And then the whole release that needed to happen was, was completely, sometimes was miscommunicated and, uh, and, and that was causing more issues for us. Uh, and then uh, I'm sure that you've seen that in other projects as well. So um, there were a set of internal stakeholders that they were leading discussions 
and they weren't allowed the team to, to be autonomous and get to decisions, plan the work, and then understand how they, they're going to deliver it. Um, so essentially, especially the last piece was, uh, was one of the requirements that, was, uh, that came from, from our development partner as well, because they were frustrated by all of these too. And they said, you know, sometimes they weren't very clear what the priorities are, and it was very difficult for them to actually do work uh, for us in a way. And, and, and deliver in a consistent manner. So we thought that um, this has to stop. And we need to sort of like create a, a framework that would allow investors in people um, to, um, to go um, back into a process that can scale. So the things that we did, we didn't reinvent the wheel or anything. You're, you're not going to see any big uh, eye-opening things in there or any wisdom. We just went back to basics on what Agile is uh, behind the process, uh, on, on, on the principles and what it tries to achieve. And so one of that is it tries to achieve collaboration between individuals uh, and allow for discussions to happen. But it does that, um, especially in Scrum you do that uh, very structured, so there's no external noise. So the team can be, um, in a way, they can feel safe that once that discussion has happened, then they have the time to deliver on that, and then that discussion can happen again in a pre predictive and coherent manner. So first thing we did and we identified is that the team working on the project needs to be guarded of all the noise. So we we provided the single point of contact, and that's the product owner, Alisa, in this case. So Alisa was responsible of getting all the communications from the internal stakeholders and the, the client, and then get these, uh, and she, she would own the communication, in a way, with the rest of the team to um, deliver the vision and make the team understand what the business value of what we're building is. Uh, and that was about it on, on the role. Then, you know, you, you see in, in other slides, then the whole responsibility of actually delivering was placed on the team, and that's the, the trust issue that, that, that Agile entails. Um, so, as I said before, we had few, a few mediums and channels to talk to each other. We tried to, to cut things down uh, a lot. So we standardized a little bit, and we said that Pivotal, which is a, a tracking system uh, specifically for Scrum. Uh, so Pivotal was our main point, main, main software to capture requirements and uh, get the work done. Uh, we started using Slack for any or all discussions. So any discussion outside of Slack was uh, for us non-existent, uh, as if it hadn't happened. And for synchronous face-to-face -face communications, we started using Skype. So um, if you ever worked with a remote team, you would know that this is not a solved problem. <laughs> Even in 2016, we don't have a video conferencing software that's good enough to actually say, you know, use that and be done with it. So we had to go to other solutions like Google Hangouts, uh, GoToMeeting, and depending on the situation, sometimes uh, internet was not great your side, sometimes <laughs> internet was not great in our side, but yeah, we, we had to, 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 to be a little bit inventive on, the, on, that, uh, on that front. Um, result was, though, that we ended up uh, working much more smoothly, and everybody felt, uh, everybody felt that they had uh, some more control around the processes and the structure of, of, of what we were doing. So uh, a little bit more, so th and that was uh, essentially what we were doing uh, with, um, with communications. I think it's safe to note here that um, once you start building up the team trust and uh, you start building a team to work together, then those, especially if you have a, a, a process, communication issues become less and less because um, people are people. And we are social beings. We work with each other. We learn each other. And then ah, at some point, we, 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 became, we become friends and colleagues. And um, that affinity allows us to actually deliver work uh, much more closely in, in, in a predictive manner together. 
Um, so the, the second pain point, um, like uh, area of pain points, was the product delivery. So one of the biggest things uh, I have I found out uh, at Discovery was that there wasn't so much involvement in I, uh, from IIT, and that was uh, directly opposite from from an agile perspective. Because um, uh, I mean, a few years back, when most of the projects were waterfall, uh, there was this kind of uh, of notion that you know somebody would compile a, a very big document of uh, requirements and then throw it over the fence uh, to someone to deliver. But you know, in, in an agile project, that's not the case anymore. You need to have a product owner who's from the business who holds the the value and the vision. Uh, within the team to uh, to answer uh, uh, questions and constantly communicate back to the team why there are things that we need to do and then get all those discussions that happen within the team and move them into the business and uh, allow that discussion to steer stakeholder discussion as well. So um, that was not happening at all. So we had a few... Um, there was confusion around the, the, uh, the requirements we had, and some of them are very high level, and some of them were very low level. So um, at some point, the, the work that was landed over the delivery partners were not, uh, couldn't be delivered because it was very high level, and sometimes it was so minute that they were leading them down to specific paths uh, when, in fact, they, it shouldn't. Uh, so we didn't have that, that feedback loop from them either. So that's the last point, actually. Um, says that what we wanted was, because uh, we had an exceptional delivery partner, and we wanted to capture the expertise and the experience they had uh, on, uh, on delivering those uh, projects into our way of thinking, and then help them shape the product as much as we shape it through, through the vision. So. Uh, some agile elements were there, others weren't, but as a whole, that process was not, uh, um, was not sustainable. So again, you see here, we just went back to the basics uh, of, of Scrum, uh, but um, we actually explain why a few things have, are happening that way in Scrum and what's the agile principles behind of these. So, we stopped having um, requirements. There wasn't any requirement again. Uh, so there were a few sp spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, that they contained strands of the work that we were doing, that they were, they were capturing the thinking. But um, as Alisa was our product owner, she had all the answers. We, uh, her and I, we started using um, um, the user story format. So we identified and we understood what kind of users do we have within the platform? And then we tried to capture those requirements from that perspective. And I think that's really important because that makes, uh, it gives you two advantages, basically. The first advantage is that um, it sort of like separates pet projects or preconception or misconception of people that they have of what the project should do. Because once you put that from the perspective of the user, then you need to actually um, uh, validate it and verify it in a way why you need that functionality. And the second thing it does, especially uh, with the acceptance criteria, is it gives you like a roadmap of what that story should be. Um, and I'll show you how we did it uh, in, in a second. But uh, the way we have acceptance criteria uh, was uh, as questions. Uh, they weren't statements, they were questions. So the, the answer should be yes. So um, an acceptance criteria for a login page, for instance, is um, can I enter my password? Can I enter my email? Can I press a, a submit button? Am I logged in? So for, for a story to be done, then you, know, you needed to, ha to, to be able to answer yes to all of these. Uh, but in, in essence, if you wanted to understand what the acceptance criteria is, you need to actually understand what the story should do. And the story then is linked back into what the value, uh, the, the value creation piece to the user. And that's a whole, it's a, it's a big discussion we had. I mean, you remember, I mean, initially when we started uh, to, to write user stories, even for a very long, uh, very small pieces, it took, uh, took us hours. But then we streamlined that process more and more and it became much easier. So that was one piece of work. The second piece of work was 
to introduce sprint goals. Um, and even though that seems a very simple or small task, uh, once you have a sprint goal, then it's really easy to allow the team to be autonomous because uh, you, oh, you don't need to be part of the decisions anymore. As long as if, if the developer has a choice of doing A or B, then you know they should do whatever is closer to achieving this sprint goal. It's as, sim as simple as that, and you delegate that decision to them. And the the only problem, which is a problem, and they they should raise their voice, is if any of the choices actually um, delivers on that sprint goal. Because then, as a team, we need to go back and understand whether that sprint goal is 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 uh, is a correct sprint goal that we have or not, and if there's any problem within that. Um, so. I think that was a very good idea for us and worked really well. Um, we had the full team participate on daily stand-ups and we had uh, we started off with a few stand-ups, uh, an internal and external. So we scrapped all that. We had one stand-up uh, same day, uh, same time, same um, every day, and everyone to participate, have uh, a little bit of a catch-up, you know, if there's anything blocking anyone, uh, basically and move on. So we, we strictly kept that into 15 minutes, making sure that everything's okay and you know, identify if any conversation needs to happen and then we moved on. Um, we started having sprint planning sessions. So that, that, that was not there. Um, so and then within those sprint planning sessions, we, we, we split them into two, two sort of like um, sessions, if you will. So within the first one, we, ident we were identifying what was important and what was the 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 user stories that we will be discovering next and within the second part of the sprint planning we were identifying individual tasks within every user story that needed to happen so we sort of had a, a top down and then bottom up approach so that gave us a very good understanding while we were going into sprints of um, how good our estimation was and essentially allowed us to become very stable you see at the results section how stable we became in terms of velocity and uh, in terms of having the same understanding of everyone, of, of, of those user stories, uh, of those user story points and how much work they actually were. Um, we introduced backlog refinement sessions and we introduced uh, sprint uh, review sessions and we allowed the product owner to be our ambassador to the business within the sprint review. So it wasn't uh, our job anymore to deliver the project, but that was like a, a celebration, uh, and the product owner uh, was was um, was demoing and uh, reviewing uh, the sprint with uh, the stakeholders and everything, everyone else, um, to to celebrate what we achieved in the previous two weeks. And it was, uh, um, and uh, in terms of functionality, we achieved really really big issues, uh, really big. Uh, stance of work and uh, terms of functionality uh, going forward. Um, so just to sum up, um, what has Scrum allowed us to do was to collaborate um, on the strategy and the technical implementation. Um, we, we improved the tracking of, 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 of our work and uh, the visibility um, of, uh, of what everyone was doing. Um, we we encouraged more open, uh, uh, more collaboration from the, the stakeholder team and we, we had a way to monitor bugs and um, capture that work within our, our, normal, our normal work. So that uh, identifying and fixing bugs made, was made much easier um, uh, and, within, and much more predictable. So um, one one byproduct of working that way was that uh, the team had complete alignment. So instead of having a client and vendor relationship and, uh, anymore, anymore, we had one team and we were all working about the same, same, uh, same vision. So we, we had complete alignment. We shared the product vision. Uh, expectations were clear. Roles and responsibilities were clear to everyone. And we had a very consistent framework to actually put foot forward and deliver that work. So. Just some sables about reframing the work, and uh, I think essentially that's the implementation details, perhaps, of, 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 of this particular uh, work. Is um, that's a user story? Uh, that's a user story. That's the format we used for e everything. So the top there, there is a, a paragraph that's describing the functionality from a user's perspective. Uh, as Alisa said, the, the the standard is delivered through uh, partners. 
Those are called uh, practitioners or delivery partners. That's what you see in there. And then it's the standard format that you see in, in, in every agile book uh, about user stories. I want to something so that the value that's going to be essentially created. But we, we kept our focus on that value a lot. And we, I mean, I know that, you know, you can, ev everybody can say, you know, that's the format that you need to write a user story and then, you know, off you go. What we did was to, to go back again and again and again and re revalidate, you know, that value. I mean, actually making sure that the conversations are happening. Is this valuable enough? Why do we want to do it? And all those kinds of, uh, of questions. And Alyssa's work was to come up with the answers and making sure that those answers then uh, are communicated with everybody so they can understand. Second piece of work in this is the extensive criteria. You will notice the, 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 the question format I was saying. Uh, but that it was the conversation. So we th what you don't see is that below this user story, there was a whole stream of comments uh, from the development uh, guys, from um, Alisa, from myself, uh, and everybody else concerned with the project that we were discussing and we were uh, understanding what the story, uh, we, we had different strategies. We, we perhaps in other situations we had to split stories or we were linking stories as in this, uh, in, in this instance. And I think Pivotal is, is an exceptional tool to, uh, it's the best tool you can have to actually deli deliver a Scrum project. Uh, it's much simpler than anything else out there and it makes it uh, really easy to link and have those conversations uh, and very streamlined user interface. Uh, so I think, I think uh, that allowed us to, to have the conversation and, and not have any requirements um, at all, but um, use that format to, to put forward what needed to be done. Um, so the final set of, uh, of, um, um, of issues we had within, w were within quality. So uh, there was a quality uh, assurance process um, in there, but the, it wasn't always enforced. And that it wasn't always enforced because it, it, it depended on who picked up the phone. Um, sometimes uh, there was a confusion around the environments and where people should be testing things before moving to, to production and what the deployment process should really be. Uh, there were inconsistencies on how the specification uh, was captured around uh, what was wrong uh, with the system. And um, requirements and strands of work didn't have test plans or specifications attached to them. So um, once we, we were moving forward and releasing, uh, then we couldn't go back and do some regressions around some of the biggest uh, things. Uh, so again, we didn't reinvent the wheel, but we were very, very persistent in some of the agile principles. Um, definition of done, it's just a simple document, but it's really powerful. It means that the definition of done is a series of steps every story needs to go through. In essence, if you go through everything in the definition of done and all of your acceptance criteria is a yes, then that story is done. If not, then we either haven't captured correctly what needs to be done for that story, so we need to add a new story to, to correctly capture the, the functionality, or we have a bug. And that streamlined the process for us very, very well. I'll, I'll give you an example of our definition of done document in, in a second. But what, what is important here to say is the definition of done needs to be the same for every story. So it needs to contain all the steps that need to be done um, to, to, for that story to, to be, to, to, to all the steps that the story needs to go before it's, it's get, it gets approved by the product owner or whoever has the approval uh, capabilities in the project, all right? So uh, two things just to improve quality and making, uh, and making that development process as transparent to everyone uh, as possible was to have a specification written before any code is written. So a developer was sitting down and he was saying, you know, that is the functional specification of what this story should do, and this is how I'm going to achieve it. So, for instance, for a story that is about creating a content type and then style it into a specific style, it was saying that I, the functional spec was I understand that this needs to happen, and then I'm going to go into Drupal, I'm going to create a content type, it's going to have that machine readable name, 
and I'm going to add fields to it. I'm going to add the field of that name into there. Now it's going to be a text field. I'm going to add another field. It's going to be a text area, sort of like that. And because we use Google Docs, um, that was shared with everyone um, and within the user story uh, in Pivotal. So everybody who wanted to have some visibility or wanted to, or senior developers who wanted to understand what the solution of a, of a more junior developer is, they had a forum to actually discuss those things. And that discussion actually helped us a lot to identify things uh, or implementation details that they wouldn't scale uh, early on before even any line of code was written. And that, uh, that helped us a lot to actually produce software that was much more scalable and um, had, had gone through that review process, even ha has started in the review process very early on. So the second thing that, uh, that the, the software developer was actually then doing was writing the test plan. That comes back to uh, the discussion we had yesterday uh, about quality. So I think it's important. I, know, I, think, I think it's imperative to have to, for, a, for a software developer at this time and age to write the test plan of their stories. They need to sit down and think how someone else comes back and uses the functionality. And that is the only way that it can happen because if we take, for instance, the login story, they need to understand how somebody would go through the steps of actually going through that, that functionality. So if you are to write a test plan about uh, testing the login, and that's before even any code is written, right? Um, you need to go by, say, okay, there's gonna be a text box. Uh, th there's gonna be a box of some kind. It's gonna have two fields. Um, on the first one, it needs to have email, and then that's when it kicks in and say, you know, do I need to have a method there to identify if something that's a, a non-email, just to make sure that um, people sort of like get, um, I, I don't stay in the resources on the server, for instance, or not. And that, that, that's what makes the discussion start happening. Even, even if it's not between people, even if it's on the developer's head, they start understanding what actually the work really is. Um, and that's er early on, again. We need to spend as much, as little as possible um, to, to understand the, the, the work and then allow them to go into development. So second was this plan. And then it makes it easy for everybody else to actually jump in and test. And you don't need to have a dedicated testing team to do that. I mean, within the same people, within the same team, within the same sprint and within the same story, you can have people who are external to that code because they're not working directly on it and have a test plan, go through it and make, a, make certain that at least functionally that works. And what I consider, this is the first step to getting into automated tests as well, because you know, at some point you will have a discussion with your developer, say, you know, do you prefer to write it in, in bulleted list or do you prefer to write code for it? And they, most likely they say, yeah, I prefer to write code for it. And then boom, so easy, you, you have automated tests. So um, yeah, we would use the testing everything that was built and we were strictly having releases at the end of the sprint. Um, to have releases on the end of the sprint, what's not written in there, we, you need to have a code freeze. Um, it was very, it, it was challenging uh, at some times, but I think we, we got there and we, we, we were fortunate enough to have a business that could understand that even if we didn't have half of a day of development, it wasn't that bad as long as we could identify some bugs and fix them and actually have much better and coherent releases. Um, so just uh, while I wrap up and I'll show you later, Alisa can explain some of what we have achieved and uh, with some numbers. Uh, this is a, a definition of done uh, document. Uh, it will, um, it will seem awfully familiar to some of you <laughs> uh, at the end uh, there, but um, essentially what it says is all the steps that need to happen before a story is considered completed. Uh, so that's everything we discussed so far. So the first thing is to have a spec written and reviewed by um, another member of the team. Uh, to have a test plan written, uh, reviewed, and passed, but the pass only comes later, right, when the code is complete. Then um, we have automated tests written and pass. We, you have the code in repository and review, that's the pull request and, um, and the integration testing passing. Uh, and then you're deploying the staging. So up to here, 
you're still within one, one branch. So if you, if you follow something like Git flow, you, you still haven't left the branch. I mean, you might have made it into development and deployed it into a development environment. But by, by this time, you've gone so, so much quality already that you don't expect any bugs. If, 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 someone find, if an external person finds a bug, it's an exceptional thing. You know, the whole team stops and say, "Why? Wow, how come there's a bug in there?" So we we managed to reduce bugs a lot with with this process, um, and then you deploy to staging, and that's that's when you start involving the rest of the people. So you start involving the product owners, uh, is the user acceptance tests. Um, you, you you involve the client to come back and and see the work, but. Um, essentially, what we do, we safeguard the work in a way. So we make sure that when they, they actually get eyes on it, it's so, so polished and everything's done that, um, um, that, that they wouldn't have any issues with it. Um, just to bring back some of the specs. Um, so this is a, a, a sable spec. Uh, the functional part, uh, what, what follows on second section is the, the technical part, which is more about the, the technical implementation. Um, so. That's the story, that's a, user, that's, that's a story ID um, that ties back into Pivotal. So if somebody searches ever with that ID, they land to that story. Um, so it has the user story in the end, functionally um, has some understanding around what needs to be done. And then second portion of it is technical. Uh, that, so you have, um, th th there's some detailed explanation on how it can be done. So again, I think this is very, very important. Some, some people would argue, and sometimes you'll find PMs that argue that this is uh, a waste of time. And you know, you, I'd rather have developers spend time developing uh, and those kinds of uh, um, um, arguments. And I can hear them. But what I think is important within this is that this is development. And this is a more structured way of actually having someone sit down and capture their thoughts of how they will address a, a development, a, a technical pro, pro, problem. And going through that, then they can share it and they can incorporate knowledge from other people who are more knowledgeable about those, these kinds of things. So this is a great way to upskill your team as well, because if they capture their thinking and then a senior developer goes back and say, you know, um, I see that you're going to try to create a class out of that, but you know, if if you're if you're uh, injecting objects into the class, for instance, and you're not using the dependency injection, then you're hard coding stuff. And you perhaps if you do X, Y, or Z, then it can be more scalable. And that's the the thinking that you need uh, that uh, allows that junior developer to 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 get to a better solution that's easier for you to scale uh, at some point but also get that education that from, from the rest of the team. So I, I consider that very important. And this is a test plan. So, uh, I mean, the, you, can, you can map that directly into a BHAT test plan uh, in a way. So you have your prerequisites out there, set up and tear down functions, and then you have your tests. And then these are uh, steps within the test. So in this particular, is you select a link, you uh, switch something, you go back and you ensure specific things are there. So it's very easy to take this. And if you get into the habit of writing these uh, for every story, it's really easy to share the testing burden within the team and make, make sure that everybody can pitch in. So not having a dedicated team, but essentially everybody can get involved. But also we found that this is an amazing way to uh, educate people on the system. Uh, and allow them to actually learn how the system works uh, and, uh, and then train others or uh, be the help desk and all that stuff. So that was uh, an added bonus, bonus for us. Um, so, I mean, in terms of culture, day one, we were an agile experiment. You know, day uh, 180, um, we were producing iterative software. Uh, we had a product backlog with functionality that we could go on for months. Uh, we have a collaborative and engaged team, and we were one team, not a client, a supplier, and a consultant. And um, we had an organization, and that was really, I mean, I, I can't stress that enough. We had an organization that was, uh, they understood that they needed to do something in that uh, way 
to actually uh, get, pro uh, get, get value back. So they were supporting us a lot. Um, so I'll hand that over to Alisa. And so, so just to go into a bit more detail on, on the specific kind of results that we saw and kind of the value that, that we saw, we've seen throughout that methodology. So as we've kind of referred to within the entire presentation, there was a steep decline in bugs. So the processes that Tassos has talked us through that allowed us to kind of document what we were creating, talk more about the value, and everyone have a kind of mutual understanding of what that functionality was, allowed us at kind of end result to have a piece of functionality that everyone understood, but also then that there was less patchy um, and less bugs. It allowed us to communicate effectively internally to the organization what we delivered. Um, and if bugs did occur, obviously, we had a process for managing those. Um, we've got kind of fully functioning product owner roles, and now that pro project has allowed us to kind of scale that up within the organization. So we have an accepted way of working within our entire organization, investors and people, that we now look at product and platform and functionality. And um, individuals can become product owners and lead on some of those things. So they can start to develop roadmaps, develop backlogs, and work with the development team in that way. So we've been able to kind of scale that model. Um, we obviously have an engaged development team um, and from the technical side we are able to use the insights and the expertise that's there and use that from a business perspective. So have the ri rich conversations up front around what we're creating and the best way to do that. Um, it's kind of scaled internally within the business, our technical knowledge, so we know how to better approach how to plan work and what the solution might look like. Um, we are iteratively developing new functionality and we understand the process for doing that and we can kind of scale quicker um, and deliver quicker for the business and for the value. Um, we have more open communication internally, our side, so not only within the, within the kind of um, delivery team, but we also have that within our wider organisation. So having clear frameworks and structures for working allows us to better communicate internally to our stakeholders, um, to management or to users within of the system, what we've created, what we will create, what could be created, and have more richer conversations around um, ideas and share, sharing knowledge and it allows us to present functionality that's created and then at that point, for example, within the sprint reviews, um, inviting people in and getting their ideas and insights and having rich conversations about the value there with those individuals too. Um, and we also kind of have, have now a better framework for that strategic thinking. So as I say, having more open conversations about what value we should be creating, what a roadmap might look like. Um, and I'll just kind of take you through. So for example, this, this roadmap, um, looks at the functionality that was created. Um, going forwards, we, we can start to better plan groups of functionality. Um, we did have a hardening sprint at the end, um, which looked back on all of the functionality we had created and looked to kind of tidy that up and re reflect on, on, on what we had achieved. So <coughs> sometimes, sometimes that has been very useful for us in the past as well. We obviously now have story points so we can better estimate work, which allows us in kind of business side to plan better. We know what something might look like, whereas before we were asking for requirements and didn't really know what, what was involved within that and therefore when it would come or how difficult that might be or, or actually how much it might cost. We therefore have a velocity now and we can better plan our time so we can say if we're looking at this type of functionality how long might it take to deliver that based on what the team can, can deliver I at any one time can i say something about the graph yeah. so uh, th i think this is the, the the most typical agile graph so uh, on the first sprint we didn't deliver anything and on the second we delivered double uh, the functionality because essentially what happened is the, the functionality of the sprint of the first sprint was sort of there but you know getting used to the specs and test plans wasn't there, it wasn't done. And, but instead of saying eh, that's sort of done and then push it, we said, no, it's not done. And we take it up to ourselves, realize that all of us haven't done it, and let's see if we can do it next time. And if we can deliver that little piece of, 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 of effort that needs to do the first minute and then move on to the second. So that's what you see here. But then you see we stabilized a lot. And I mean, you always have fluctuations. Uh, it's a story point up or down isn't, isn't much. Because that, that, that stability helped us then plan and prioritize and actually have a budget, a 
estimation through that, uh, uh, through something that's so le relative because that, that wasn't tied back to today. That's just purely story points. So we, we had like a, a relative measure that we, it was shared and understood between us, but that measure was then used to actually estimate budgets and estimate times of delivery. And because we were consistent with that, we could do it every time. So we, we, we tied effort into, uh, into um, money and time, basically. Uh, but that came organically. So that's it, yeah. Thank you. I just want to add in the back, just before we get some questions, um, that there is a white paper uh, that you can follow on that link. And people who follow that link, they can get 50% discount on the book we have out uh, with uh, Pack Publishing on developing for Drupal 8. So um, here you go. So any questions? Please. Oh, yeah. Oh, you, Who do you prefer for doing QA, project managers or developers? Um, so uh, I have no preference. I mean, uh, I think that there's one team, and within that team, people can be flexible in a way. So if, if there's time um, for project managers that they can pitch in, um, the way we work, they have a test plan. They can do it easily. If, if a developer is waiting for their story to be uh, reviewed in a pull request, for instance, and they have uh, half an hour, they can do the QA and, and uh, you know, just have it as a, as a, Lego, a, a Lego block. Uh, there was an interesting discussion we, ha we had uh, yesterday, um, um, Mr. Anastasius here, um, and he was saying that you need some distance sometimes uh, fr from, from the project. And I agree with that, and I think the distance that but, but I think that the distance a developer has from somebody else's code is, is distance enough to allow them to, to, to test it in a way. And that's not the final test step. That's the test step before you get in actually in front of, of, of your uh, designer to have the designer review uh, in front of the client to have um, user acceptance test and all sorts of stuff. So I think, I think, uh, I think that is my answer, basically. And I don't know if, you, if that answers your question well. Yes, thank right. you. Thanks. Anyone else? No? All right. Thanks very much. All right. Now, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I missed the very start. So I don't know whether you, you highlighted how long it took you to really bed into the process and uh, to build up and the level up and, and get in tune with it. So um, essentially, it was those two sprints, uh, I think. Um, so, yeah. Um, no, we we were fortunate enough to to have very skilled skilled people uh, in every aspect. So, um, I'm not going to talk about myself, obviously. <laughs> Alisa, uh, the development partners we had were very skillful, uh, and obviously, nothing is a is a is a bumpless ride. Uh, we had our ups and downs, but we we were open. We were discussing them. And we we were flexible, and you know we 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 prefer to fail fast rather than fail late and retain some pride. I mean, we we were encouraging people to to to, to bring up those kinds of things, and we and we we tried to have like a very flat structure. There wasn't any any hierarchical structure at all, so everybody was able to bring their their views and make it. One more thing that uh, I think everyone would like to have such an enlightened client. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think the project was um, kind of initiated outside in terms of we knew that we wanted to better understand the process of delivering that that product, and I think a lot of a lot of clients are, are happy to kind of hand that over and, and not maybe see that process through. Um, but our kind of ambition was to be become involved in that, so we could we could also benefit from from the rewards of understanding what that process looks like and get the technical expertise to, to pull that in as well. <laughs> so one, one thing to say, and that's not covered within this, is that then we went and so the, the, the business uh, um, actually um, 
were very fond of what we achieved, so they scaled Agile into other uh, other places as well. So we did lots of strategic thinking around Agile with uh, with impact maps, and then that allowed us to to map strategy to goals and all the way back down to development. So that was that pr perhaps that's a, another presentation mm -hmm. uh, for another time. But uh, essentially, yeah, um, I, I also conclude that it was a. It was really, I, I was really happy to work with these guys because they, 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 they were always interested in new ways of working and they were, w I mean, the, you couldn't ever hear like the negativity. I mean, even if something was off and they weren't used to it, uh, they were more in, uh, they were more prepared to actually give it a try, see if it works, rather than just, you know, guard themselves in a corner and say, no, we can't have it. <laughs> so, funny. yeah, I mean, they're true to their name. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, importantly, it was a, we knew it was going to be an experimentation process. Um, so we went into it looking at it like that um, and just trying to learn as much as possible. Any other questions? Right, so thanks very much for coming. Thank and hope you got something out of it. Mm -hmm.